you know, one thing I, I just wanted to kind of, uh, you know, connect with you on is, you know, where, what's the draw to Latin America? You know, it, it's interesting because you've done so much now in the region. I think you're probably the most prolific investor that not everyone knows because you're kind of low profile with a lot of stuff. Um, you know, you're, you're not like, thank you for like granting me this interview because normally I don't see you. I actually looked on YouTube and I, I can't find almost anything about you on, on, on YouTube. Yeah. The last thing was from like 2010. So thank sort you. For, by design. Yeah. I know. Um, I know. <laughs> um, well, yeah, a couple well, so look, what I enjoy, what I told you I enjoyed is building things. Right. And, you know, doing things that wouldn't be there otherwise. And, um, that's what I really enjoy. And so venture capital for a while didn't feel like that, to be honest. Um, as wonderful as Facebook was, that was a, actually a low point for me personally um, in, in that I, I mean, we knew it was a good investment when we did it early on. We didn't know it would be what it became, but you know, and it didn't, you know, so, but it didn't feel like a sense of accomplishment at all, right? I mean, yeah, we sort of got to know the guys, man, you know, gave him money and whatever. But look, Facebook's success was not due to Kevin Effersey or Excel or Jim Breyer or, you know, really any of his board. I mean, it was Mark and the team he built and Cheryl. And they, and so, you know, I was watching them have what I viewed as all the fun. They were building the company and, you know, doing all that really hard work. Um, and it felt very removed from that, you know, as an investor, it's like, well, okay, I recognize them and picked them, but, you know, was I building anything alongside them? And, and, and um, so, you know, with Excel, we had created a fund or worked with, and it kind of started a fund and, and partnered with a fund in India in about 2006. And I was involved in that and spent time with the Indian team. And at one time we had a partner fund in China called IDG. And when I would go to those places, in particular India, that felt different. You know, that there was, the, it was so raw. The, the ecosystem that was so raw and the entrepreneurs were so earnest and they really needed our help, right? I'm really basic things on like how to do this and how to build an ecosystem, how to build a company. And it would, it, it, but it was so um, early, you know, you'd go into a, a building in India and on the bottom floor, there'd be a goat walking through and, and, and a hole in the wall. And you get to the second floor and the receptionist is a woman with a PhD in you know, biochemistry, and then they're working on something incredible and smart, humble, hungry people. And I was like that, okay, I love doing this. And so we thought about actually moving to India for a period of time with my wife and bringing our kids to kind of help them build that fund there. Um, and it wound up sort of pushing the group to invest in something that became Flipkart, which, we, which worked out pretty well. Um, and, but you know, it just was gonna be too unlivable for the family. Um, we got little boys love running around playing sports. There isn't a lot of green space. And, and so we're kind of looking for that kind of an adventure that you feel like you could build something and build an ecosystem. And, and, and I had some experience with Latin America. Um, I, right before business school, I had spent three weeks in Venezuela with a couple of friends back when you go to Venezuela. And it was uh, phenomenal, you know, and the people were right. And so in around 2010, um, you know, between Facebook and I was in Border Groupon, you know, Brazil in particular was this crazy um, growth story for those companies. And I couldn't figure out why. It was literally the number two or three market worldwide for Facebook and Groupon revenue wise, not just users. I'm like, Brazil, you know, the average American's impression of Latin America in general was sort of dirt poor and, you know, third world. And you know, we really know concept of what a Brazil was, which is sort of a first world country and a developing country combined, right? And, um, and, and so then I went down to visit to see what was going on. I spent time with the Facebook and Groupon employees in like Sao Paulo, and they showed me around and the ecosystem was like, this is really incredible. I'd love to spend time with this, knowing that it's going to take, you know, 10 years to build an ecosystem. Probably the first few investments we make are going to be bad because, you know, the entrepreneurs don't have the experience yet. And, you know, but if you're in it and you stay in it through the ups and downs in the long time, eventually, you know, we saw what happened in India, which, you know, at first it's hot, then everyone runs away and thinks it's terrible. But if you stay and keep going, then you have this incredible position, just like the guys in China did. You know, they began doing it in 99. Everyone thought it was hot. Everyone ran away when the bubble burst. But if you stuck with it by 2003, 2004, 2005, you had Baidu and, 
you know, Tencent and, you know, Alibaba and all these companies that were, that people left for dead. You could have had all the stock you wanted in Alibaba for nothing in like 2003, 2004. So, so I was like, all right, so it just requires a lot of patience and I really like the people and the entrepreneurs and, and let's do it. And, um, you know, what I liked about Brazilians in particular, sort of in contrast to maybe some other emerging markets is that, you know, they're collaborative. Like they don't view business as a zero sum game for the most part, especially the younger generation. It's sort of, how do we kind of, they negotiate and they like to negotiate and, and, you know, maybe longer than most people do. But by the end of the day, they want to get to an agreement and they want to collaborate and they want to build things with you. They, they're friendly, right? And whereas in other countries, there's a sort of paranoia because maybe the country had been communist or been threatened. And so they, there's this paranoia of investors and they fear you and they think you're trying to take advantage of them. Whereas in Brazil, I've never felt that for the most part. They, they, they feel, they understand that you're a partner. And, um, and so it's been great. And, and that led to, you know, working with some entrepreneurs and relationships that I can really treasure. Like, you know, you know Gabriel at, at Quinto and Dar, and yeah, got to work with you a little bit and got to work with, um, you know, Caesar at, at Gym Pass and some other really great ones, you know, Santiago now at Newton Shop. And there's some other real, really great ones at Ricardo at Flash. And so these are really, really fun. And I can't believe the ecosystem now. I mean, you know, and I also was sort of an early investor i was an investor in the first fund of kazakh and advisor to those guys Ernan was a business school classmate of mine at stanford and then monashis i've been investing with for, since the same time so it wasn't their first fund because they had these this unusual fund structure but it was very early and advisor to them and have invested in every fund since just the same with kazakh and watching those guys grow up and mature and you know become forces in the region watching the ecosystem go from there was no success stories. Everyone would talk about Mercado Libre or there was nothing to now, you know, you're having second time entrepreneurs and third time entrepreneurs. It's amazing. And, and, and you know, in the philanthropy side, there's been, you know, the, when you sort of ask why, why do you like building things? And, and every person needs to ask themselves why they're doing what they're doing. For me, it was, it was about development. It was about you know, creating jobs, creating opportunities, and then, and then changing the status quo, hopefully for the better. And in Latin America, you know, one of the things about the ecosystem early on that was so interesting, but also sad was that, you know, you're, you're, if you were a bright, talented young person coming out of university, your only choices were either to go work for, you know, the government, Petrobras, or, you know, a big bank maybe a U.S. multinational like Unilever um, or go to the U.S. But there was nothing really exciting to do um, in, in a lot of ways. And, and then when, so when we were doing these startups and we were trying to recruit these really talented people and get them out of, you know, some investment bank or, you know, whatever, Unilever or Procter & Gamble, whatever job they had, or maybe even Dell Brazil, they wouldn't want to join. They were just too afraid, right? There was no success pathway and and um and then combine that with sort of the political situation which is you don't need to talk about too much but just you know highly corrupt and not really serving development you know it was sort of either solely about redistributing wealth or solely about maintaining order and protecting the wealthy there was no you know un understanding of a, you know people really representing people well. And so the idea was, look, if we can develop this and create alternatives and create a whole ecosystem of, of technology companies and new entrepreneurs that then become wealthy, maybe some of them will run for office. Maybe some of them will change the balance of power and make it both more democratic and more educated and competent. And um, so that's the why. And then as we began working on it, we decided, well, and began making money doing this. And you know, it's like, well, how do we reinvest that money back in to reaccelerate the why? And that's where Lala got started, um, which was a. Yeah, can you explain what Lala is for the people listening? Uh, it, you know, it's something that I've had a lot of conversation with Diego over the last, you know, since you connected me with him. Um, I think you and David both connected me. And uh, I mean, he's an impressive guy and building something really important for the region. But can you just share a little bit more about, you know, what, what excites you about what they're building and, you know, what impact you think it can have? 
Yeah, I mean, well, Lala, the idea is, so it's all started with actually something in Africa that we've been involved with called the African Leadership Academy. And, and you know, we lived in Africa for a period of time, we'll get into that, but, um, and it was a couple of Stanford business school kids, you know, one was African, one wasn't, that started this thing with the idea that how do we create, you know, over the next 10 or 20 years, you know, that a few thousand really high-end leaders who eventually someday can go run these countries, become senior ministers, because there weren't really any competent ethical senior leaders in most African countries. And so the idea was to create a school that was very different, that would bring people from all over Africa and, and get them together where they have relationships from a cohort and then, you know, tr- give them training and experiences on social change and leadership and entrepreneurship and, you know, really what you'd want a, a government leader to actually be, not, not what they are. And, and then they get them into these amazing universities all over the world. I mean, you know, Berkeley would get seven kids out of a kid class of 100 at ALA. And then Stanford would get a bunch, Harvard would get some. Notre Dame and Harvard would fly their admissions officers out to ALA to interview every single kid and then pick them and run them a spot. And so Diego worked at ALA for three years um, and, you know, as sort of a chief of staff. And then he said, well, Latin America could use this, but we need to maybe modify how we do it because it's a different model, different set of needs. And, and so he incubated that with, um, w- with his partner, David, and um, to create this sort of basically leadership program for kids coming out of high school before they go to university to teach them about how to you know, become a social entrepreneur or social leader for career in public service. You know, how do they tell their story if they're coming from a really disadvantaged background? And most of them do, you know, kids from favelas or from the poorest areas all over Latin America, but also some wealthy kids too. And, um, but kids really who want to come back to the region and make change, be leaders and run for office. And so that's what he's building. Um, and so uh, David Velez is working with us as, as a really important kind of lead supporter, and as well as a number of other folks. And it's great that you're signed up and um, we're really excited. But, you know, the work has sort of led me to bump into other great social entrepreneurs. In particular, I got to give a shout out to this gentleman, Eduardo Mufarej. I don't know if you know him. So he sold his company, um, Somos Educasau, for a few billion dollars a number a few years ago. And instead of, you know, getting, just taking this and buying real estate in Miami and living the life he could live, he's committed deeply to the same type of change we sort of talked about in a way that I, I don't think I've ever seen. I mean, so he created something called Hanova. I don't know if you've heard of Hanova BR, which is this program to train people to run for office and train them on ethics and, you know, and, and how to win and, and get ethical leadership in office. And he had like a class of, I think, 1,500 people in this program and in the last election cycle municipal elections in brazil he got 153 people elected to mayors city council you know all this stuff and then the next one will be the next elections the state elections and the parliament will be and it is incredible and you know he's and so one of and it's connected because one of the lala kids already joined nova and won and won a city council election in their city so there's people doing this amazing work to try to take this innovation, this wealth, this education, and then plow it into, you know, creating opportunities for kids who are really talented, but don't have opportunities and get them into leadership positions. Cause that's when things change, right? When you have someone who's really educated, really ethical, but also grew up in a really difficult situation. If one of them is a politician, Chance, they're going to understand the problems that the, the poor people and, and the people all over feel, yet they'll be educated on the right things to do as opposed to just populist, you know, redistribution and handing money out. You know, they'll understand how to you know, promote growth. And, and, you know, that's what we're kind of, so that's what excites me uh, on the nonprofit side. So that's the why of what I do. And, you know, Lala, Lala is the why.